Hi everybody. Um, so we're gonna have a little fun with this one. This is gonna be a little bit out there, but um, basically the whole inspiration of this speech today was I get approached a lot from people from all sorts of backgrounds, from STEM backgrounds, liberal arts, performing arts, regarding how they can get into data science. Um, and you know, I thought about this from someone who comes from a performing arts background, or from a liberal arts background, um, who doesn't have a traditional data science background. And I feel as if there is something that can be learned from um, a liberal arts or performing arts background. So, today we're going to first learn a little bit about you guys, and then I'll talk a little bit about me so you can understand why I made this presentation in the first place. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to go into talking about the myth of the left-right brain um, theory and where that comes from, and a little bit about imposter syndrome. Then I'm going to talk about the theory of multiple intelligence, um, skill versus talent, practice versus deliberate practice, the Dunning-Kruger effect, multidisciplinary talent, and um, further resources. So, just so I can get a better understanding of the room, which is really relevant for my presentation, actually, can anybody raise your hand if you are currently a student, um, recent graduate? Um, wow, everyone's professionals here. Okay, cool. All right, so almost 50. And how many of you work in data science, data analytics, business intelligence, data engineer? Cool. All right, how many of you have a STEM background? Most of you guys. Okay, but not everybody. Um, how many of you have a liberal arts, performing arts background? Wow, that's actually more than I thought there would be, so that's cool. <laughs> um, very cool. Well, to talk about myself a little bit, it's actually somewhat relevant. So I'm a manager of analytics and operations at Saki and Saatchi, which is um, an advertising firm. Um, and we work mainly with Toyota as our client. So my background, I was essentially a music major. That's essentially my background. Um, I wanted to be a full blown music major, but my parents told me that I should have a backup plan. So I became a music and business major. I felt like that would be a good compromise. And then from there, I enrolled in a master's program at Carnegie Mellon in entertainment industry management. And it is just as eclectic as that sounds. So it's a information systems management school that houses programs in entertainment, arts, and, um, and IT, essentially. Um, and public policy as well. So we had sort of a mixture of having experience from those different programs. Um, then I decided I want something that was a little less multidisciplinary, right? I wanted something that focused a little bit more on something grounded um, instead of kind of dabbling in different industries and in different um, studies. So then, or currently actually, I'm pursuing an MBA. Um, and then since I wanted to work in data analytics, um, and I'm selling myself a little short here. I have worked in data analytics for a while now, but um, I wanted to progress towards data science. So I got a certificate in data science because I said, hey, I want to feel legit. So I got myself a certificate. <laughs> um, and then in terms of hobbies, just to humanize myself a little bit here, um, I love learning how to code. I love learning data science. I'm playing Terraform on Mars right now. Um, I'm trying to play Devil May Cry right now, but I'm still studying, so that's sort of my hobbies and background. So some of you guys are probably looking at me like this, and I honestly feel like this is how a lot of employers will look at someone like me, like this. Um, they're like, what were you planning with those degrees? Where's your stats major? Where's your PhD? Um, and a lot of people approach me with that same feeling. Um, and that's understandable, because a lot of people feel like they need to have a particular degree, um, a particular school, a particular program on their resume. And so I asked myself, why is this? And I think a huge reason is because people still kind of believe in this idea of left brain and right brain, that some people from a different pedigree, a different um, 
different studies, different majors that they have to be on one side or the other. And I think I was sort of pigeonholed, and I think a lot of people are pigeonholed, to be on the right side. And they're, so they're wondering why the hell am I on the left side right now? Um, and I think a lot of people think that because they sort of predetermine the side that they're supposed to be on, right? So a lot of people say, oh, I'm not good at math, or I'm not good at learning guitar, because they've already applied all their talents to what they are good at. So there hasn't really been um, a trial as to whether they're really good at something or not. Um, but even when people have proven aptitude in certain, um, certain disciplines, they still tell themselves, I don't really belong in this area. And I think it has something to do with this. I think we're all sort of uh, familiar with this concept. Who in here has felt this at some point? Let's be honest. <laughs> at some point. <laughs> At some point. Um, I think some of you guys are selling yourself a little short because apparently 70% of people have this. So, um, and it's okay to have it. I think that it's um, perfectly normal to talk about. I definitely have it. <laughs> um, but the thing is, it's actually very prevalent in people who feel like they don't belong in a certain area because they don't see representation of themselves, whether it be because they come from a certain background um, women, minorities particularly, have a high prevalence of imposter syndrome. And personally, I came from a family where no one was on the STEM side. No one. Like, I can't think of anyone in my family who has a STEM degree. So, honestly, I felt like an imposter. And this whole concept was actually coined by two women, Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Ives, in 1978. Um, and it kind of feels like this for the most part. Um, and according to Caltech studies, this is exactly how I feel sometimes. Um, according to Caltech studies, people see themselves as inadequate despite evidence otherwise. Um, in the Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology, people perform less well and more anxious in general, even if they have the experience to back it up. So whether you have zero, zero, um, zero years of experience or 30 years of experience, <coughs> It's impartial to, um, to, to imposter syndrome. And it more or less comes off as this. So you're somewhat in the middle of, hey, I'm not doing anything special here. Like, don't pay attention to me. Or you're discounting the value of what you're doing. So I did some research. So I was actually curious of where this whole concept came from in the first place. Um, it came from a um, Harvard professor by the name of Howard Gardner, and he wrote Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligence in 1983. And he basically, he basically said that there's eight types of intelligences, and he goes into musical, and linguistic, interpersonal, spatial, visual, etc. And he also left room for a potential knife. But for the most part, it's been debunked, and um, a lot of people have said that you know it's too broad. These these forms of intelligence that he's mentioning, they're really no better than like zodiac signs. He's basically talking about personalities, um, different traits that people bring out in themselves. But there's no like actual hard science to it. So this is wrong. This is completely wrong. Now, not to say that people don't have talents in things, that they don't um, work towards something. That's not a myth. But skill is practice and application, um, which begets talent. So my argument here is that basically what we're talking about is the difference between hard work and talent. Um, many people believe that they lack talent, but it hasn't been tried yet. They haven't given themselves a true trial yet. And essentially, we have hard work is something that's intentional, that's actionable, and talent is perceived to be this thing that we're kind of born with. Um, and an example that I like to use here is Mozart, because it turns out that it actually took him about 10 years before he wrote something that was considered popular or before he became a huge popular um, composer. Um, and so, 
this whole idea kind of gave birth to the 10,000 hour myth. I don't know how many people are familiar with this concept of this book. It was pretty popular. Um, but basically, Malcolm Gladwell wrote that the key to success in pretty much anything is putting in 10,000 hours of work, um, which roughly equated to 20 hours a week for 10 years, I believe. Yeah. And he references Kay Anders Erickson, who's a psychologist, and he did a study on actually a group of violinists um, who went to a music academy in Berlin. And essentially, this idea was pushed on us as music students. I remember this concept in music school. It was just to get us to practice more, essentially. Um, so I did some research on this because I was wondering the legitimacy of this actual study. Um, more or less, it's actually also a myth. It's, it was oversimplified, and there's three main reasons. First reason is that Erickson, the psychology that the, the book was kind of based on, <coughs> he said that the 10,000 hour thing was pretty much arbitrary. Um, it was a estimate. The actual number on average for the violinists who were at the school was 7,400 hours, but that's not a sexy number, so he used 10,000. Um, second, only half of the best students at the academy actually put in 10,000 hours. And third, and this is perhaps the most important, is that when you put in work, it doesn't matter how many hours. It matters if you make adjustments and how you're practicing. And if you don't make any adjustments to how you're trying to achieve something, you're going to end up with the same result like this dog did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the biggest flaw in his study was that he didn't take into account the quality of practice. Um, and in fact, practicing without adjustment, and this is something we learn a lot in music school, is worse than actually practicing in some cases because you're really just practicing how to do something the wrong way a million times. Um, and so this is actually the um, Dr. Erickson, and he said the distinction between deliberate practice aimed at a particular goal and generic practice is crucial because not every type of practice leads to approved ability. You don't get benefits from mechanical repetition but by adjusting your execution over and over to get to your result. So this idea of deliberate practice, what do we mean by that? So we generally mean practicing with intent and with a specific result in mind. So identifying your weaknesses, adjusting, making corrections, re um, repeating, and having support, especially a mentor or someone who has been there and has made these mistakes before. Um, violinist Nathan Mil Milstein said, practice as much as you feel you can, accomplish with concentration. Once when I became concerned because others around me practice all day long, I asked my professor how many hours I should practice. And he said, it really doesn't matter how long. If you practice with your fingers, no amount is enough. If you practice with your head, two hours is plenty. And so, Many successful people use deliberate practice to achieve their goals. And so basically what I'm trying to lay out here is that it doesn't matter how much you practice at something or how many hours you put into it because the return on investment will eventually level out if you're not doing deliberate practice. And when you do deliberate practice, you'll see that over time that you will grow your skill. So again, what we're talking about here is deliberate practice begets skill and begets confidence. And so basically, if we talk about the steps here, we're talking about getting motivated, whether that be, you know, reading a blog or maybe you see that job that you want, and then you make smart goals. So specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Um, be consistent and persistent. Seek feedback and be sure to recover. And the reason why I like to bring up the Dunning-Kruger effect is just because, as you can see, there is somewhat of a relationship between <coughs> having knowledge in a field and having confidence. And that kind of ties back to the imposter syndrome that I was speaking about earlier. Because without confidence, it actually does have a negative effect and it can get in your way. 
And so the people who live here are probably like the 30% of people that don't have imposter syndrome. Um, but for the rest of us, we do have to go through the rest of this relationship. Um, but as you can see over time, even though confidence does dip, the more you grow, the more confidence you'll have. So why am I talking about all this? So data science, and people have probably seen this Venn diagram a lot, right? It's a multidisciplinary field, right? You've got your math, you've got your stats people, you've got computer science, and then you have your domain expertise. Now, in my humble opinion, there are very few people who are experts in all three of these, right? There are people who have PhDs in math and statistics, there's people who are amazing in computer science, and there's people who are like gurus in their industry. But there's very few people who are 100% excellent in all three. And the reason why I bring this up, and it sounds kind of controversial, but the reason why I bring this up is because I get approached by many people who ask, well, how can I achieve this? Like, I don't have any of this. I don't have math or statistics. Um, I don't have computer science. Or maybe some of them do. I actually get approached by stats people too, <coughs> stats and math. Um, but my argument is that if you come from a liberal arts or performing arts background and you haven't touched any of these other circles yet, you probably live in the domain expertise area. You have an expertise in something. You went to school for something, right? Um, and then the other two can be learned um, with a lot of deliberate practice. And I also want to bring up this. Because data science is a multidisciplinary field, we often forget the multidisciplinary part, right? And we know that it's a STEM field, but my argument is that it's actually a very creative field. Um, there was a speaker before me that spoke, she spent a lot of time, and I, I'm glad that she did this, she spent a lot of time talking about the difference between academia and industry. And that's because there's a lot of context and um, feature engineering and communication and making actual value and giving business solutions, um, doing improvisation, having curiosity, um, having interpretation, making adaptations. In my personal opinion, this is all creative attributes. And I feel as if creativity is very pertinent in all of this. And the funny thing about it is these are very human qualities. So without these, humans aren't even really necessary in the data science process. Machines would just do this job. So it takes us to do the feature engineering for now. Um, it takes us to do the visualization. It takes us to do the communication. It takes us to talk to people who maybe don't come from a data background. And what I'd also like to do as we get closer to a closing here, is to revisit the whole idea of the left brain in the first place. So I realized it was kind of baloney in the first place. So if we look, it says, I'm the left side of the brain. I'm a scientist. I'm a mathematician. I love the familiar. How many of us have experienced something at work that was unfamiliar? Right. Um, and I think that's a very strong attribute for anyone who works in data science, data analytics, um, or pretty much any field. I categorize, I am accurate, linear, analytical, strategic, practical. How many of you have been asked to do something that was impractical? Right. Um, always in control. Is that ever a thing? <laughs> um, a master of words and language. Realistic. Sometimes we're asked to do things that are a little real, unrealistic, um, or we have to find a way to make it more realistic, right? I calculate equations and play with numbers. I am order. I am logic. There's a lot of things that work that are illogical or have no order. Um, and I know exactly who I am. Sometimes at work, I don't know who I am because I've been given assignments and I'm like, I don't know if you guys know how this works. <laughs> so my whole point here um, is to A, as if you are approached by people who are in performing arts or liberal arts and they're interested in the sciences, whatever it is, whether it's computer science or statistics, um, I think that 
the data science community could do a better job being more welcoming to people who are interested from other backgrounds. Um, because at the end of the day, what I learned the most from being a performing arts background is that no matter what you're doing, it takes a ton of practice, a ton, a ton of practice. And everybody is capable of doing that, for the most part. For the most part, everyone's capable of practicing. Um, so, so what now, right? Like, what do you tell someone? Or if you work in HR and someone comes across you and they have the stats and the math and the computer science, but they don't have the PhD or they don't have um, something that's traditional of a background, as you would say. Well, some people go to grad school or they get their PhD so that they can feel more competent in the field. My argument is that you, you could do that. And that's perfectly fine. It's essentially what I ended up doing for a little bit. But there's also learning, right? There's learning on the job. There's learning at home. Um, people are probably super familiar with all of these. Um, there are people who work in data science who still do this stuff, right? Um, so meetups, events like this, um, different programs. I think Coursera even has like master's degrees now in data science or something like that. Um, so yeah, definitely understand that there's resources out there if you're a person who's still new in the field. Um, and most importantly, practice, practice, and then perform. And that's it. I think I probably have time for questions if anyone has any questions. Yes. Anyone has questions? How much time did you take to make this presentation? Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, maybe like an hour. Really? Yeah. So do you? Oh, thanks. It looks like lots and lots of stuff. You need to read up on Sachi and Sachi. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. I was wondering if you think that you have any special skills that you've gained from that background and what people might consider a nonlinear track that you actually contribute as a data scientist now that other colleagues in the field who have gone more like statistics straight mm -hmm. in or coding straight in don't have. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there's definitely things that I actually underestimated that um, I believe are, I actually believe it's a, advantage having came from a performing arts background and that's the concept of realizing that you're never really done with your work like you're never really done learning like no one finishes learning art right there's no there's no finish line to that um, so I learned that and then deliberate practice that was something that I definitely leveraged because coming from a performing arts background um, I definitely came at a disadvantage since I don't have a statistics or, or math background or anything like that um, so it took me a lot of work and a lot of, um, a lot of time studying things that weren't super familiar with me um, or familiar to me. So yeah, I think practicing and just knowing the value in that, which has, I think has paid off. <laughs>